Good morning and welcome to Shattering Mist, the program that is devoted to those who are open to the realization or have come to recognize that all of the world's religious, political, economic, media, and military institutions are corrupt and counterproductive. I am Yada. Our number, if you'd like to join us anytime over the next two hours, toll free 877-300-7645. I wasn't going to start here, but... It caught my eye in the, uh, as opposed to listening to the SRN ads, I, uh, I couldn't help but read about the plight at Louisville. Louisville. Uh, Scott, you do a sports show, so you know more about this than, uh, than I do. But as I understand it, ESPN's Outside the Lines uh, interviewed some um, uh, current and former uh, University of Louisville uh, basketball players and uh, and also uh, a woman called the Escort Queen and came to the conclusion or at least printed the story that Louisville was uh, was using um, prostitutes as strippers to uh, recruit basketball players to uh, Louisville. Uh, Patina, who is the coach, very famous coach, very effective coach. Hall of Fame coach. Yeah, Hall of Fame coach. If that's the case, it's news to him because he certainly never authorized such a thing and and he oversaw the recruiting uh, efforts. What's the story here? Uh, Well... Me and you, me and you have a very different. Uh, you know, when you first told me about it, I, I really, I don't care. Every every college in the country is doing this. Uh, you, you basically, the story came out and it just told me that oh, they're recruiting college athletes with parties and sex, and that's something that has gone on from the dawn of time. <laughs> yeah, my my view was that uh, that uh, it, that if student athletes are uh, engaged in. Um, fraternal parties, and if those fraternal parties have a, a sexual component to them, uh, they would be part of the 99% uh, of activities at a university. My only issue was that if, uh, if the school, its uh, coaches or administrators or teachers were sponsoring those parties, were providing the alcohol and providing the uh, sex through prostitution, that that would be a problem. Uh, and uh, according to ESPN and the Escort Queen, not that the Escort Queen is uh, is a bastion of, of mortal fortitude, no, she, uh, but uh, and, she, and she, yeah, as I understand it, she uh, she uh, uh, took at least two or three of her daughters and and got them into prostitution. So she's a lovely mother. She said at first she was against it. But they kept insisting. <laughs> oh, that uh, they okay, great, great. So, so basically, uh, yeah. they knew their mom was a was a was an escort uh, hooker uh, or whatever. Hooker. Yeah, and, hooker. and yeah, yeah. Probably, yeah. Remember that the uh, uh, Big Bang Theory uh, where they uh, um, uh, one of the characters, uh, the uh, Jewish character, whatever his name is, was uh, in the dumps, and uh, and Leonard uh, uh, decides that uh, he would hire a prostitute. Uh, uh, before him and the other, uh, the Indian character uh, said, uh, Raj said, are you a prostitute? <laughs> yes, I'm a prostitute. Yeah, that's what an escort is. They're a prostitute. Um, now, I'm just laughing because uh, uh, Patino uh, says that he's unaware of it. Uh, and it was definitely not used in recruiting. And the ESPN, if they inferred that it was used in recruiting, is absolutely wrong. But that uh, uh, that a coach... Uh, an assistant coach at the time, his name is McGee, is the person who is alleged to have paid for the strippers. Now, if McGee, as a coach, pays for strippers, uh, that's probably not a good thing. No, and I mean, obviously you don't want your... I, I, I just don't like I don't like the yeah. mock outrage that ESPN runs on, and that everybody yeah. likes to run on in these things. I, yeah. It's no, so I agree with it's you ridiculous. It, it's something that is. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, I don't care. Yeah, yeah you you and I probably have a similar view on. Uh, on drugs and prostitution. I think prostitution and drugs ought to be legal. I think people ought to have free will to do whatever they want to do. I don't participate in drugs. I don't participate in prostitution. I have never done drugs. I have never uh, used a prostitute. Uh, and uh, I have no interest in, uh, in either of them. But that's a choice that I want to have the opportunity to make, and I want other people to have that uh, choice. I think that we serve our, our communities poorly when we impose laws that restrict choices so long as those choices are not um, uh, injurious of other people's rights. 
You know, you want to kill yourself. You should be allowed to kill yourself. You know, go to town. Don't kill anybody else. Well, yeah, just don't kill anybody else. You know, I got no problem with a suicide bomber. So that as long as they only take themselves out. You know, and I and I'm 100 percent in agreement with, the, with everything you just said. Um, if you want to be, but, but I don't want I, I don't want a person paid in a public institution uh, as a coach to be providing uh, prostitutes for uh, their uh, their students, their team, the players. I don't want them. I mean, if if the kids want to do it, they say, yeah, we got the money, let's, uh, let's go hire a prostitute. I don't give a hoot. Uh, but when the coaches do it, I, that, if it's true, I would have an issue with that. Yeah, um, especially if it's coming out of the the, the state given funds to the program. Yeah, of course. Like yeah, of course. I mean, and, but now, the a other lot thing, of these things come out of the out of the so-called booster pipeline and things oh, like that. Of course, that. yeah. He's giving he's giving it, cash it, by boosters, it, and then the booster passes it on. Yeah, that's that money that's on. Right. Yeah. It's money that's not on the books. If the NCAA had one modicum of morality then uh, I would say that if that occurred and booster money was used to pay for prostitutes, then Louisville should be held accountable. But then then you would expect a, uh, a school like Penn State, where the, the uh, coaches uh, look the other way and uh, turn a deaf ear towards, uh, towards pedophilia, you would expect them to be banned from college football for uh, all eternity. If there was one modicum of morality, um, in the NCA, because there's none. Oh, I think I'm like you. I just think I just think the whole conversation here is is uh, hypocritical. Uh, Louisville, if, if they suspend Louisville, it affects their, the NCAA's basketball money. Because right. Louisville is a big program, and that's the biggest uh, part of the NCAA's money. Because the, the the football program, which makes 95 percent of the overall money, the football money goes to the schools. Primarily, where the basketball money, because from, of the tournament, from the goes to yeah, goes to the funding the NCAA and, and all and, of the other stuff that it does. And Louisville has a big fan base, and they're a big draw. Yep. Uh, and same with Patino. So, and this is, I mean, I, I always say this all the time myself, is that uh, you know, I always joke that I wish the Gophers would just start cheating in sports <laughs> because then we could have good programs. Yeah. Uh, but Wasn't but it, the but the bottom yeah. side of that is that yeah. my pr- the the University of Minnesota is the one that the NCAA. Uh, the, it's a program that they would love to come down on. Yeah, it's a big enough name yeah. that, that it they can look like they're strict, yeah. but it, it doesn't affect their their bottom line. You know, you know it was uh, interesting that uh, that uh, 30 for 30 program on uh, the Trojan Wars about uh, the USC uh, during uh, the um, uh, Uncle Pete Carroll's uh, uh, reign. It ultimately came to the same conclusion that I came to, that the NCAA, because of the fact that Emmert was uh, from Miami and Miami had lost its swagger, uh, decided that they would uh, they would destroy USA and the, and the football program at USA because it was way too much fun. Because it it uh, you know it was able to attract celebrity status, and because other schools weren't having so much fun. Uh, the the uh, NCAA decided to put the death penalty on USA for what really was a non-event as it relates to their program, um, and uh, you know I just see the and then when when Miami was absolutely guilty of having boosters provide bucketfuls of money to players, uh, there was no uh, issue at all with Miami because Emmert was the athletic director of Miami. It sounds like a great uh, institution, uh, <laughs> a real bastion that people, oh, yeah. a bastion of light that people should look to. Yeah, in fact, they couldn't even impose any sanctions on Miami because there were too many breaches in ethics by the NCAA itself as an organization, and yet it had penalized USC for uh, for breach of institutional control when the NCAA itself was actually in federal court shown to be an absolute collapse of any institutional control. Yeah, the, uh, okay. the combination of Title IX and the NCAA renders college athletics a, uh, a mockery. All you need to know about the NCAA is that if you were, uh, up until about three years ago, if you were hungry, and yes. like, uh, well, there's the story about and, the, and, the kid and you, and you got an extra donut. Your yeah. uh, your school could be sanctioned. And well, there's the story about the coach uh, who got uh, they they lost scholarships and stuff because the coach took the kid out to lunch to tell him that his mom died. 
Yeah. Oh, and by the way, there, you know, if you if you're not counting your text messages. And keeping track and saying, okay, this person responded to me. Now, if I send a text message out to this person, is that one more than uh, than the NCAA allows in communication? But that I'm going to be sanctioned for communicating via text. And you just go, come on. And you've got rules for everything except the things that matter. Well, basically, what they when they put rules like that out, they make it so the kid is now just uh, the coach can't actually take an interest in the kid, a personal. Of course, interest. of it, course. It, now yeah. it just becomes a uh, you know. Well, because your... so you, we, we won't we don't want personal interest because NCAA student athletes are de facto slaves. Now it's uh, it's uh, voluntary servitude in the sense that uh, they're conscripted. Uh, so they are slaves for the three or four years they're part of those programs, but they're not paid. They uh, they must work, uh, and they generate enormous wealth for their masters, but they are not to be paid. And so any uh, familial kind of relations with a student athlete would destroy the whole master-slave um, setup that the NCA has so cleverly masqueraded under student-athlete. Yeah, isn't that uh, isn't that amazing? The, uh, last year, last year, the Alabama Crimson Tide made 123 million dollars on their football program. On on their just total on their sports. Well, but there's only one. There's only one program. There's only one program in Alabama, Alabama that makes uh, money. All the rest lose money, with exception of the one that makes money, and that would be the football program. You know, and they pay. You know, they pay Nick. Uh, uh, oh, they pay Saban. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that was 2008 that they yeah. made that. That wasn't okay. last year. All right. They pay Saban seven million dollars a year. Now, is he worth seven million dollars a year if he generates uh, over a hundred million for the uh, the school? I think so. Yeah, definitely. That's a known. I. Uh, <sighs> I want to turn to a story, and I know we're, we're going to go through the, uh, the malfeasance of the United States uh, relative to, um, uh, to Syria and how the United States deliberately and knowingly created the Syrian uh, crisis. But when we return to Shattering Mist after the commercial break, I want to cover uh, uh, news that came out today. Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, is being criticized for telling the truth, for saying that the Palestinians, Palestinian leader, and at the time it was not a Palestinian leader because there were no Palestinians. Uh, this would be the uh, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem um, persuaded Hitler to carry out the Holocaust. Would it be said, Benny Hinn is a complete and utter fraud. He is a man who makes merchandise of men. If you were to buy a ticket to see this guy, then you are absolutely wasting your money and you have polluted your mind to the point that you have lost all ability to think. And it's disgusting to me that I would have to come back on the air to talk to you after an ad promoting Benny Hinn. Benny Hinn has never healed anyone. His whole game is to fake healings for the express purpose of soliciting money from ignorant people who are desperate for hope and will believe anything no matter how ridiculous. You know, good grief, what a shame. I'm just extraordinarily disappointed by the, uh, the caliber of so many of the advertisers on this program and so much of what is promoted by this network. Now, that might be SRN, but then shame on GCN for continuing to use SRN as its newsfeed. And if GCN has a problem with me telling you the truth, that Benny Hinn is a complete and utter fraud, then fire me. The accepted story in the United States of what's happened, well, I'll tell you what, excuse me, I want to uh, return to this story. Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu has been criticized for saying the Palestinian leader. Now, he shouldn't say Palestinian leader because there was no Palestinian back in the time of World War II. During World War II, there was 1940s, there were no Palestinians. The first time that, that the Roman misnomer, Philistia, was, uh, was used to actually describe a people was after the uh, 1967 uh, war. 
that the Muslims lost, not in fighting for a Palestinian state, because there were no Palestinians at the time. At the time, the West Bank was part of Jordan. At the time, Gaza was part of Egypt. All that, that the Muslim world wanted to do, by their own admission, was to obliterate Israel, to wipe it off the face of the map uh, following World War II. And during that time, during the 1967 war, there were absolutely no people referred to as Palestinians. So, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amen al Husani, could not have been a Palestinian. And this is the, uh, the argument that the mythical people known as the Palestinians are using to condemn Netanyahu now. And if I were Netanyahu, the first thing I would say is, excuse me, there were no people known as Palestinians prior to the 1967 war. And therefore, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amen al Husani, could not have been a Palestinian. Moving on from that, that he, the Benjamin Netanyahu said that the Grand Mufti persuaded the Nazis to carry out the Holocaust. That is a statement of fact. On this program, I did at least a week of shows on this particular topic. And I did that week of shows on this particular topic by being extraordinarily thorough in my research. The principal source of documentation on this is the Nuremberg Trials. And the transcripts of the Nuremberg Trials show absolutely, undeniably, and conclusively that the Grand Mufti persuaded the Nazis to change their plan relative to Jews. The principal plan of the Jews, uh, uh, for the Jews, by the Nazis early in the war was to strip them of their property, of their rights, to rob them of their property, their land, and all of their possessions, their businesses, to take everything from them, to vilify them, and then to uh, expel them. The Nazis wanted to get rid of them after stealing their property. It was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, this, uh, this Haj Amen al Husani, who came up with the, the plan because he was in charge of, he was the de facto Muslim leader, probably the supreme Muslim in the world at that time, uh, over the British mandate. And as part of that British mandate, this, uh, this man, uh, uh, brutally murdered, massacred Jews, all with British support. In fact, if the Jews tried to protect themselves, Britain went absolutely berserk. And so he went to Hitler and said, no, don't export them. They're going to come here. I don't want them here. Kill them instead. Put them in concentration camps. He sold the idea to the Nazis. That's a statement of fact. Mr. Netanyahu insisted Adolf Hitler had only wanted to expel Jews from Europe, but that the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amen Hussani, told him burn them. Now, I will tell you that in my research on this, and as I say, I devoted a week of shows to this, uh, and I read everything that was available to be known on it, including all of the transcripts from the Nuremberg trials. And it is absolutely certain that the Grand Mufti played an enormous role in transforming the exportation of Jews, the original concept, into the extermination of Jews. Now, whether or not he said burn them, I don't know. But that was certainly the consequence of Humani's uh, insistence. Kirk, do you recall, you, you um, are a historian, um, have you ever done any research on this, or do you recall the shows that I did on it so many years ago? I remember the shows, and I and I did a little, a tiny little bit of research. I mean, it's, it makes sense in context of the British involvement uh, in there, and the fact that they sent all those. Uh, well, you remember how they got there? The first 
at the first part of World War One with the uh, Jewish guy giving them uh, mm-hmm. uh, synthetic fuel. I mean, not synthetic fuel, but a synthetic gunpowder. And then the agreement was, I'll let you have your land, and, and then they reneged on everything. So from that, and out of that context, you know, you started getting a flood of people going back to Israel, and they were buying land. And that obviously upset the upper part of the uh, Muslim world. Yeah. So uh, uh, from there, it just it was pretty easy to see why you would want somebody to say, "Don't send them." Yeah, and, and you know, it's uh, it, it, right in context. It's uh, it's obvious. Uh, you know, uh, Busani spent enormous amounts of time in Berlin. Uh, they have subsequently found. Uh, uh, talking points and, uh, and notes that he had in his hotel room. Uh, they were in the walls of a building they recently tore down of Husani's stay and uh, insistence that the, the Jews be exterminated. Um, and the Nuremberg trials, the testimony of those who were at the Nuremberg trials, say absolutely. He not only met with Hitler, but more importantly, he met with the with Hitler's uh, um, I. Inner circle. The inner circle that were specifically responsible for the final solution, and that he was part of the council that drafted up the concept of a final solution. And those meetings are not only well documented as to Husani's participation in them, but because of the Nuremberg trials, we know the who said what to whom and when. And it's very clear, undeniable, that Husani played a major role in the Holocaust. They they made a, a documentary about the final solution uh, where they all met mm-hmm. uh, and and did that. And I can't remember whether the Mufti was in it because I wasn't aware. I wasn't thinking that way at the time. So, but uh, no, that's well documented that they met and decided this is this is the way we have to do this. Yes. Oh, exactly. And and so here is uh, Israel's opposition leader. So this is a, po- a political leader who would be a liberal, who would be therefore poisoned with political correctness, therefore who who would be advocating a lie that, uh, that is politically correct, uh, said that this was a dangerous historical distortion. So the, uh, yeah, Israel's opposition leader, who is a socialist, so, therefore, a, a socialist, secular humanist, so indoctrinated by political correctness that they're calling the truth a lie because it's politically correct to do so. The a senior Palestinian officer, uh, official, meanwhile, sh- said it showed Benjamin Netanyahu's hatred of Palestinians that it was su- to such a degree that he was willing to absolve Hitler. Now, he did not absolve Hitler. And he can't be show a hatred of Palestinians by uh, by referring to the Grand Mufti because the Grand Mufti wasn't a Palestinian. As a matter of fact, the Grand Mufti was uh, the political vehicle. I mean, this, the religious vehicle, of course, was Islam. Uh, he's the, the Grand Mufti is a religious title. It's an Islamic title, but. The political vehicle that he used to promote his uh, his agenda was the Arab League, and he wanted what he he viewed Arab and uh, and Muslim as synonymous, and so he referred to himself and his fellow Muslims in the British Mandate as Arabs. So when the the Palestinians, this mythical people, has an official that says it shows his hatred of Palestinians. No, it shows your absolute ignorance of history. Amazing, isn't it? Uh, yeah, but, and it would make sense because they, the British were all tied up with the Arabs because they wanted the oil. So they, whatever you want, whatever you guys want, we'll, yeah. we'll renege on everything we told them. The one of the things that I did in a series of shows is I showed just how demonic destructive, uh, immoral, the British oversight was of, uh, of this area. And how the only reason the, uh, the British were over it is because Muslims had come to their aid. They had bribed Muslims to fight other Muslims uh, in the Turkish uh, Ottoman Empire. And where, they, where the Ottoman Empire had stolen the, uh, everything from the Byzantines, uh, and were occupying everything that they had stolen by force from the Byzantines, the Ottoman Empire was defeated in World War I. And the means to that happened to be uh, that the only reason that, that 
England even survived to have America bail it out in World War I is because uh, Chaim Weizmann uh, invented a synthetic for, uh, for rubber that could also be used in smokeless gunpowder. And just to be able to move uh, English uh, material uh, through that trench warfare, you had to have rubber. And they couldn't get rubber, and so Chaim Weizmann invented it. Chaim Weizmann literally saved the British Empire. He was given uh, I, the opportunity to make a single request for what he wanted in return. He said, I just want a homeland for my people. And he was given, therefore, uh, Israel, which was to include all of Jordan, it's called Transjordan, was to be given to the Jews as their homeland. And then the Brits reneged on it when the Muslims screamed bloody murder and said, you know, you, if you do that, then, then we'll deprive you of oil. Yeah. And that's, that's what happened. And the Brits then were merciless in their treatment of Jews. They just despised them. Hussani, who died in 1974, was a Palestinian national leader. That's an absolute lie. So this article is, a, is promoting a myth. He was not a Palestinian national leader. Uh, he, he was a Muslim leader, and he promoted Arab nationalism, who led violent campaigns against uh, Jews and the British authorities. No, he, didn't, uh, he did not lead violent campaigns against the British authorities, but he did certainly lead violent campaigns against Jews in what was called the British Mandate in the uh, 1920s and 1930s. He fled the territory in 1937, but continued his campaign to oppose British plans to partition it into the Jewish state and an Arab one, aligned himself with the Nazis during World War II. Yeah, he did, man. In fact, he was the only... He was the head of the Waffen-SS unit, which was the only SS unit that wasn't... By ethnically German, and that's be, and it was a hundred percent Muslims. So it is an Islamic SS unit, and he was ahead of it, uh, uh, fighting and killing in the Balkans. Uh, Hussani met with Hitler in Berlin in November 1941 when he tried to persuade Hitler to declare his support for the creation of an Arab state. Now. This uh, was according to German press reports at the time. That would be the Nazi media at the time. And that wasn't what he was there for. And that absolutely is not what the Nuremberg trials say. He was there for a singular purpose. He wanted Jews dead. I uh, quote, Hitler didn't want to exterminate the Jews at the time. He wanted to expel the Jews, the Israeli, Israeli prime minister said. That's a statement of fact. And Haj Amen al-Husani went to Hitler and said, if you expel them, they'll come here. That's exactly what the transcripts of that meeting reveal. And the transcript of all of the other meetings that he had with Hitler's inner staff. So what should I do with them? Hitler asked. He, Husseini said, burn them. However, the chief historian of the Yad Hassan Holocaust Memorial in Jerusalem, Professor uh, Dina Peratt, said Mr. Netanyahu's statement was factually incorrect. Yeah, uh, the only thing can be factually incorrect about that. Burn. Maybe he burned them. Yeah. All the rest of it. Said, kill them. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what he would have said is, is kill them <laughs> as opposed to burn them. That's so much better. You know. <laughs> yeah, you cannot say that it was the Mufti who gave uh, Hitler the idea to burn Jews, she said. Well, you, you can say that, and she says it's not true. Well, it is true, but you can't say it because of political correctness. Their meeting occurred after a series of events, uh, after a series of events that point to this. Well, their meeting uh, took place at the time that, uh, that Hitler was, uh, was uh, trying to deal with uh, all of the Jews that, uh, that he had. But, you know, in 1941... We didn't have the death camps. You know, the United States... That was going to be the question I was going to ask you. Yeah. When, did, when did they actually start building these? They built... Uh, uh, yeah, they weren't... They were... They, I mean, yeah, they, they, built built some, they built some work camps. Mm -hmm, work camps and stuff. But, but, exactly. they, but death camps? No, that was uh, much later in the war. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Uh, 42, 43, 44. Uh, most of the deaths occurred in 43 and 44. 
opposition leader Isaac Herzog said the Prime Minister's remarks played into the hands of the Holocaust deniers. No, it doesn't. Why is telling the truth play into the hands of people? Uh, this is a dangerous historical distortion, and I demand that Netanyahu correct it immediately as it minimizes the Holocaust. No, it doesn't. It minimizes Nazism and Hitler's part in our people's terrible disaster, he wrote on his Facebook page. Hardly. The uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization's Secretary General, uh, Erkat, said in a statement, it's a sad day in uh, history when the leader of Israel's government hates his neighbor so much that he's willing to absolve the most notorious war criminal in history, Adolf Hitler, of six million of the murder of six million Jews. By the way, he is not the most notorious war criminal in history. He's the most notorious war criminal in modern history, but certainly not in history. The Muslims were vastly more murderous when uh, they stormed out of Arabia following Muhammad's death. Mr. Netanyahu later responded to the criticism and said, I had absolutely no intention of absolving Hitler of his diabolical responsibility for the extermination of Europe's Jews. Now, read Mein Kampf. It's, uh, Hitler clearly hated Jews. <laughs> yeah, but you know, he, which you have to be really careful of, Hitler's hatred for Jews alone would have done nothing if it didn't resonate with the German people. The reason that the Holocaust happened is because the German people hated Jews. Yeah, they gave them up. And the German people were willing to accept a lie because the lie was uh, acceptable to them. That's why it happened. It's the German people. May I remind you, even the article it says that Hussani met with Hitler in Berlin in November 1941. The decision to systematically kill the Jews, I'm reading now from Wikipedia on the final solution. The decision to systematically kill the Jews of Europe, irrespective of geographic borders, was made at the time of the Wannsee Conference, which took place at the Wannsee Villa in Berlin on January 20th, 1942. The conference was chaired by Heydrich and attended by 15 senior officials of the Nazi party and the German government. Most of those attending were senior representatives of ministries with responsibility for the Jewish question, the interior ministry, the foreign ministry, the justice ministry, and the ministries of the eastern territories. The purpose of the conference was to discuss and coordinate plans outlined by Heydrich as to how to best implement the final solution of the Jewish question. A surviving copy of the minutes of this meeting was found by the Allies in March of 1947, but it was too late to serve as evidence during the first Nuremberg trials. Therefore, it was not a meeting that took place after the fact. It took place before the fact. Then, as I, uh, I stated before, from July of 1942, Operation Reinhardt, the mass murder of Polish Jews, initiated the systematic extermination of the Jews. This is July 1942. This is long after the November 1941 meeting. Himmler's speeches to the Posen Conference on October 6th of 1943 is where he discussed why the Nazi leadership found it necessary to kill Jewish women and children as well as men. This now, by October of 1943, became the official policy of the Third Reich, the extermination of the Jewish people. Pretty clear to me. What are, what is the, the, those duped by political correctness, those corrupted by the inability to think, to promote lies as truth, even though they're lies? What corrupts serve, people to do that? To serve what end? Yeah, to serve what end? It's, it's, here the, uh, the historian is saying you can't say that because of facts that have been known subsequently. Actually, you can say it because the facts demonstrate that this is when the Grand Mufti was in Jerusalem and that his meeting with the architects of the final solution and with Hitler preceded the implementation of the transition from exportation to extermination. Well, even, even if he went there and just became a cheerleader, he's still a dog. 
That's an insult to my dog. Uh, yeah, that's, oh. this, is, this is true. It is. When you read the first Nuremberg trial testimony, virtually everyone that, that was there that was trying to say, oh, boy, you know, it's not really our fault. It was promoted by this, that, or the other individual. All fingers point to the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. That's the fact. We have uh, Glenn with us. Glenn, are you upset that I uh, besmirched the reputation of Benny Hinn, someone that you have uh, have pushed back against, or um, uh, no. the, uh, the criticism of Benjamin Netanyahu for having the chutzpah to tell the truth? Uh, well, neither, neither, actually. Just a quick, I heard someone refer to this yesterday. I just looked it up. Um, apparently, recently, there was an auction at which was sold a postcard um, mm -hmm. from May of 1930, stamped in you know, a postmark in Alexandria, Egypt, sent by Golda Meir to a friend of hers in Tel Aviv, Palestine. And it's in the handwritten address from 1930. Mm -hmm. So the, the place, the British, the British called British the place. Palestine. No. The British called the place Palestine. That was the yeah. That was the intellectual snobbery of the whole thing. Why? Because the the British were influenced by the Roman Catholic Church, and the Roman Catholic Church grew out of the beast that was Imperial Rome, and Imperial Rome renamed Yahuda and Yisrael Palestina in 1935 or excuse me, in 135 CE uh, to to rename Yahuda after the the principal enemy of Yahuda, as presented in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. And so they, just to be a further insult to Jews, they used that term. And because the Roman Catholic Church had so much influence on the continent of Europe, the snobs in the continent of Europe, maybe as a product, you know, of the Jesuits and their uh, interference in, uh, in education, the snobs continued to use the terms because the snobs didn't want to refer to it as Yisrael. So uh, they named the place Palestina, which was the official name.